Are multi-level marketing companies like Herbalife nothing more than pyramid schemes, leaving failure in their wake for the unsuspecting who buy into the dream? Are two proposed congressional bills stating they'll protect against pyramid schemes actually loosening restrictions? We'll hear from leading experts on both sides. And first up, William Keeps, the dean of the School of Business at the College of New Jersey, recognized as one of the nation's foremost authorities on multi-level marketing companies and pyramid schemes. He, in fact, has served as an expert witness in the prosecution of pyramid schemes. And Bonnie Patton, executive director of truthandadvertising.org, committed to educating the public about deceptive marketing and fraudulent advertising. Welcome, both of you. Thank you. Thank you. I consider Bill the conscience of the industry, who's taught me a lot, and Bonnie, obviously, a seeker of truth and advertising. I'm going to start with Bonnie. Tell us exactly what a pyramid scheme is versus a legitimate firm. The difference is that pyramid schemes generally are concentrating on recruiting others into a business where the primary function is to continue to recruit and duplicate um, so that the people at the top can make money and those at the bottom that are continually uh, recruiting and duplicating end up losing money. And just to, to, for an overview, what's the success rate or the failure rate of distributors who join these firms? The failure rate is very high. Um, it is definitely, uh, conservatively speaking, above 88%. Wow. All right, Bill, tell us briefly uh, what there's two anti-pyramid uh, laws uh, that are on the books, one an amendment and one a law, the Moulinar Amendment. He's from Michigan and the Blackburn from Tennessee. Take us through that, and are they going to help protect us against pyramid schemes? Okay, thanks, Tim. Uh, well, first of all, I'm going to go in reverse order and, and answer your last question first. These will not help protect against pyramid schemes. In fact, they're going to protect the industry from being prosecuted. Um, firms in the industry um, have been seeking protection like this for at least 14 years, uh, and their goal here is to tie the hands of the FTC because the FTC has been very strategically identifying companies within this industry who are actually operating pyramid schemes, and they have been successfully prosecuting them. A number of companies have been prosecuted uh, that either were members of the Direct Line Association or had some sort of relationship with members of the Direct Line Association. And so this is actually a protect-the-industry effort, um, and the labels are really just um, dressing to make it appear as if they're doing something other than that. Um, and, and this will limit uh, the funding and the, and the opportunity for the FTC to prosecute pyramid schemes? That's correct. Well, the uh, um, Appropriations Amendment speaks directly to funding. And so the Molinar Amendment um, will limit the FTC's ability to direct resources in this effort. And, and FTC has ongoing efforts, even as we speak, to stop companies who are running pyramid schemes. And pyramid schemes come in a, in a wide variety. So that's why Bonnie said in general, uh, there are pyramid schemes that have sold services, pyramid schemes that have sold products, and even pyramid schemes that, like I said, have been leading members of the industry association. And so... If the FTC cannot direct resources that way, um, then, in fact, their enforcement arm, and there are eight regional offices of the FTC, will be completely tied up in this, in this effort. And I just want to make one fine point on that, and that is that ever since the 1990s, um, the FTC has never lost a pyramid scheme case. So this isn't a matter of we don't really know what a pyramid scheme is. We know what they are. The FTC knows what they are, and the courts have been enormously consistent in determining what is a pyramid scheme. All right, one more question for you on this. Uh, this bill, I think the Moulinar Amendment, and maybe both, says that uh, this problem of inventory loading where uh, distributors get stuck with stuff they've already paid for, that they will, uh, the, the uh, firm, the multi-level firm, has got to buy it back at 90% of cost. What's wrong with that? Well, the problem here is, first of all, a pyramid scheme charge does not necessarily have to involve uh, inventory loading. The Burn Lounge case, the last case that went all the way to the appellate level, did not involve inventory loading. And so to suggest that inventory loan, uh, to inventory loading or allowing the com forcing the company to buy back inventory in and of itself will protect against pyramid schemes is a red herring. The other thing is that many, many, many companies have already had buyback policies in place and, and very, very few people actually return their inventory. And there are a lot of reasons for that. Sometimes the 
companies make it difficult. They put in expiration dates, or they say if you bought a package of six and the outer wrapper is unwrapped, those six cannot be returned, even though they themselves have never been opened. Um, but in addition to that, in this kind of a distribution system, it's usually a friend, a coworker, or a neighbor, a family member who has actually involved you in the process, has recruited you. If you return this product, you take money out of your friend's pocket. So what really happens here is people would prefer to walk away with their losses than to actually engage in some sort of convoluted, often convoluted um, buyback program. If we look at the history of these companies and the history of these buyback programs, we see very, very little activity. So A, this doesn't protect against pyramid schemes because it doesn't address the main issue, and B, the actual practical aspect of, of returning inventory literally is hampered by the nature of these relationships. Bonnie, now, um, recently the, the FTC had that settlement with Herbalife, $200 billion, but um, the business was allowed to go on. Is this a Pyrrhic victory? Did this not uh, eliminate what looked like a pyramid scheme or what was claimed to be one? The FTC allegations in their complaint clearly defined a pyramid scheme, even if that word was not used. And I think what the settlement required Herbalife to do was to restructure its business to act as a legitimate MLM, one that sells its products to consumers outside the business model and ensures that there is oversight to make sure that it's following the rules that it has agreed to uh, with the FTC. All right, now we'll get to your specialty. Um, The Truth in Advertising um, uh, group uh, that you head up has some claims about basically false science. They're pretty pervasive that these MLMs make. Go ahead. Right, so we looked at all members of the Direct Selling Association that were selling nutritional supplements. And what we found was that 60 out of 62 of those companies were making illegal health claims, either directly or through their distributors. So they were saying um, that their products could cure, treat, or reduce the risk of things like cancer, ADHD, Parkinson's disease, Alzheimer's. And it was incredibly pervasive um, throughout all of these companies. So um, what that tells us is that all of these uh, DSA companies are completely ignoring the code of ethics that they say they're supposed to be living up to uh, with the DSA, which is very concerning. And in fact, wasn't Herbalife uh, considered to be adhering to the code of ethics at the same time that the FTC ended up basically taking apart their structure? Absolutely. And not only um, Herbalife, there was another company um, called Zima Nutritional um, Company that we looked into that their distributors and the company directly were making illegal health and income claims. And this is a company that was already on the hook for an FTC consent order for making such illegal health claims. So not only were they violating um, an FTC order uh, and violating the DSA Code of Ethics, but they were also an award-winning company of the DSA, having received an ethos award um, from the DSA. And the FTC went after Vima as an illegal pyramid scheme. And the court found um, in a preliminary injunction that all evidence pointed to the fact that it was a pyramid scheme, uh, allegations which were later settled with the FTC. All right, Bill, just a couple of seconds. Do you have an estimate on the total losses distributors have uh, sustained in this industry? We know that the... uh uh, industry reports 15 million or so participants each year. Um, on average, they're going to uh, either purchase or um, try to sell somewhere around seventeen, eighteen hundred dollars worth of goods each. Um, and it varies. Uh, some um, participants have bought in in the hopes to buy in at a higher level that they will make more money. And some schemes are structured that way, but easily. You know, we're talking about um, hundreds of dollars lost by 
at least many hundreds of thousands and probably millions of people each year. All right, uh, Bonnie will join us in the final segment again. We're going to have a mini debate with the head of the trade group of the DSA, the president there. We appreciate Bonnie and Bill. Forensic talk with Jim Campbell, in-depth looks at big crime stories, exclusive interviews only on Forensic Talk with Jim Campbell. And we're back. Christine Richard is a former reporter covering financial markets. She's the author of Confidence Gabe about the collapse of the bond insurance market, which helped kick off the 2008 financial crisis. Now the founder of Orion Research, does investigative research for investors. He spent the last four years, in fact, researching the multi-level marketing company Herbalife for Bill Ackman's hedge fund, Pershing Square Capital Management, which made a $1 billion bet that the company's stock price would fall to zero on revelations of wrongdoing by the company's management and its top distributors. Welcome, Christine. Thank you for having me on. All right, let's start out right off the bat. Why hasn't Ackman's bet gone to zero yet? The stock market uh, believes that Herbalife's business is going to uh, be able to continue to recruit millions of distributors around the world and sell billions of dollars of products. The company did come under, as you know, for the last few years has been under a great deal of scrutiny and agreed to pay $200 million um, under an FTC settlement last summer um, to people who were deceived by the business opportunity. Um, and make some pretty significant changes to their business model. But so far, investors are betting um, they can weather this. Um, let me ask you this. The fact that um, the FTC dramatically forced them to, uh, to make changes but didn't put them out of business, does this in the end sort of uh, legitimize uh, uh, their pyramid scheme or uh, make overall prosecuting of pyramid schemes tougher? And, and with that question, Carl Icahn who uh, has bet opposite that in, uh, with Herbalife, said that this says this proves that they're not a pyramid scheme. When the FTC announced the settlement and took questions on, uh, on the company, and what, one of the, the key issues uh, people were asking is, does this mean, you know, is Herbalife a pyramid scheme? Um, and the FTC's uh, then um, uh, chairman, Edith Ramirez, was reluctant to say. I mean, what, what she would say is Herbalife is not, not a pyramid scheme. That is a reflection of the fact that there just isn't, you know, a good definition of what a pyramid scheme is. Um, and, you know, as a result, I think we're seeing some, some attempts now to, to try to legislate uh, what it is. But I, I don't think, surely the, the supporters would say, yeah, Herbalife has been through um, you know, been through the mill. Its its uh, business practices have been thoroughly scrutinized. Um, I certainly don't don't think that's the case. All right, that's a nice lead in. Uh, there's that we've been talking about on the show. There's two proposals from congressmen that are c- called anti pyramid scheme uh, acts. Basically, um, do you think that they are going to get to that point? They, that they're really anti pyramid. Where, where do you where do you stand on the two proposed bills? I don't think. Their um, anti-pyramid scheme um, bills, I think, you know, just the opposite. What they seem to be setting us up for is to allow MLMs to operate in the way they've always operated, but to be able to say, well, we have, we've defined ourselves as not pyramid schemes, um, so now we're, we're free to, to do what we do without the kind of scrutiny that Herbalife came under. And I think the whole MLM industry, um, you know, which recruits and uh, – brings in millions of people every year in the United States and around the world. I mean, they want to avoid Herbalife's fate. They don't want to have to show that they have retail sales. And that is, that's basically like one of the big changes uh, that the FTC imposed last year was you need to show us that, you have, that your distributors need to prove to you and you need to prove overall to the government that you have profitable retail sales. Another component is that's supposed to protect distributors is that if there's inventory loading where they're forced to buy this stuff they can't sell, they can get it back uh, 90% of the cost value. Do you believe that that's going to work? There's already inventory loading. Just to say, you know, that, okay, we ban inventory loading. We, we agree not to insist that our distributors, um, uh, people participating in the business, they do not have to buy a certain amount of product. But in fact, they do. It's, it's not called inventory loading. It's called qualification, and it's just all over, 
all over this industry. You know, until you reach a certain level, you won't get commissions uh, unless you're proving that you and your group buy a certain amount every month. You you know you won't advance to the next level where the commissions increase. So, um, I, I think it's it's a no. I, I don't think just restricting the, the the official use of the word inventory loading is going to change at all how the industry works. All right. Um, back to Herbalife for a second and all your research, um, this, this incredibly low odds of making any money, 90% basically make nothing. It's one in 10,000 up chance to make the president's team. I want to put a little human face on this now behind these numbers. You've done a lot of work with this. Uh, you claim that Herbalife has actually preyed on Hispanic and low-income folks. Uh, talk about that, from how that's happening, and, and from a human perspective. In the Hispanic community, Herbalife Nutrition Clubs have been a really big way for people to get into the Herbalife business. That's sort of been the approach, you know, this idea that you will be able to set up your own small business. There will be very little scrutiny of documentation, social security numbers, but this is a, a, a route for you to, you know, kind of get on the, the path to the American dream. If you will support your family and pass on money to your children by running this Herbalife Nutrition Club. And what's happened? We went into communities across the country. There will often be a central club run by a top distributor, which will persist year in, year out, and have many distributors that they're are working there. They're working there for free. They're coming there every day to consume shakes to show that they're they're on track to 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 do what the top distributor says. And then often you'll find a ring of closed clubs, you know, in the in the blocks and the neighborhoods surrounding the main club. Um, they'll be shuttered, or or you can look at business filings and see that the person who owns it this year or owns the lease on the club. Um, is different from the person who owned it last year, and that person is different from the one who owned it the year before. So, so a few people, I think, are making a lot of money perpetuating the idea that this is a genuine, you know, realistic small business proposition, and then you see a lot of failure surrounding it. And I say for folks... Uh Netflix has a betting on zero, which is a documentary about that. And you can see when Christine uh, talks with these folks, the, the personal uh, feeling of, of, first off, losing money and, and, um, and, and suffering and very emotional. The other thing, this nutrition club, they're not allowed to advertise. They're not allowed to use a logo. They're not allowed to have visible interiors or a website. Herbalife is a brand. Um, how, how are they selling this as a successful business when you're not allowed to do any marketing? I would say through through deception. Yeah. I mean, you you get the top person who's in the recruiting business, and they um, appear at all these events at which distrib you know distributors are constantly encouraged to to attend these events, often to travel to different cities to attend them, um, or there's there's local events almost weekly in some cases, and and regular classes that people get into attending, and. Really, the whole message is just bringing in someone who is succeed who has succeeded at recruiting, and telling everyone else, "I did it, so can you." You know, I came from Ecuador um, 15 years ago. I was working, um, uh, you know, two jobs, uh, working in a kitchen, delivering food. I, I didn't hope that I would ever um, own a house in the suburbs and send my children to good schools, but. I've done it, and so can you. So the, there's a whole training system and qualification system. If you buy enough product, they'll um, let you work in the successful clubs. If you buy enough product, they'll let you um, come to some specific trainings where supposedly you'll learn the secrets of the business. So again, you know, this idea that the participants, you know, are not having inventory loading forced on them is inaccurate. The, the message is clear. You buy a lot of product, prove to us you're committed, and we'll help you, we'll help you get, uh, you know, okay, in just get a, in financial just a, freedom. All right, we've been talking to Christine Richer, the founder of Orion, does brilliant investigative research in behalf of uh, investors. Our final segment, our mini debate, pro and con, the anti-pyramid bills. Thank you, Christine.
And we're now joined by Congressman Marsha Blackburn, Republican, Tennessee, 7th District. She serves on the House Committee on Energy and Commerce. She's the chair of the Subcommittee on Communications and Technology. Been a small businesswoman, author, mother, and grandmother. We share. We just had our first grandchild. And I also worked one summer for Southwestern, where uh, you apparently were very successful at. Well, that is good to hear. Yes, I said a lot of those skills of educating, communicating, and being able to succinctly push your ideas forward. You learned that. Yeah, we should say that's a a direct uh, marketing firm of the type that we've been talking about. Now, let's get right to it. You proposed the Anti-Pyramid Promotional Scheme Act of 2017. How is that going to uh, rid us of pyramid schemes? Tell us. What we're seeking to do is to put some definitions in place so that consumers are protected And also individuals that are in direct selling are able to say, no, these are not pyramid schemes. There are some people out there that think that anything that is direct sales or anything that is multi-level marketing ends up being a pyramid scheme. So what we seek to do is to put something in statute and be able to draw some differences. Okay, um, one of the things that uh, the critics have raised, uh, in fact, I, I have a quote from Dr. Peter Vandernat, former FTC economist, pyramid expert. He's calling this somewhat the Pyramid Protection Act. The pyramid acts have always been said if you're primarily recruiting um, and not doing external sales, that's a pyramid. Your bill is going to say that internal sales only um, is is fine, and um, which has gone against case law. Tell us um, what you what exactly you're trying to accomplish. What we're seeking to accomplish is a couple of things: making certain that people have appropriate buyback programs mm. for product, and that individuals who are wanting to use the product and buy the product, that of course that is fine. You know, one of the things I think that is important, Jim, mm-hmm. is that when you talk to some of the companies that do direct sales, they will tell you that the people that are earning in, um, you know, the six figures or uh, earning big amounts is the exception that most people go into this and say, look, I want to earn a couple hundred dollars, uh, $300, $500 more a month. So what you want to do is make certain that those individuals have an avenue and that those individuals are protected. You also have people that are students, like you and I were at one point in time, mm-hmm. and who say, look, I want an uh, opportunity to pay for my college education. And so you go into a direct sales program during the summer, like you and I did with the Southwestern Company, and benefit tremendously from learning how to sell and learning how to work with customers and build that relationship and educate about a product that you are seeking to sell. Very well-run company, I, I, I might add. Um, the- yes, and you know, one of the things I, I noticed this week, and it was so interesting because the bill was coming up, and uh, they were listed as one of the best places to work in Nashville, and you're right, you know, they're, I think, 170-something years old now and a very well-run company. All right, let me ask you this now. You said that a lot of folks are just looking for a few hundred bucks, uh, which certainly uh, makes sense. The statistics uh, overall, Herbalife themselves, uh, 89% of their um, uh, distributors earn zero, in fact, and the top 1% take 90%. And obviously, recruits are going into this as a business opportunity, not just students looking for uh, to help pay part of their tuition. Um, th- those aren't very good uh, success rates or very good chances for these poor folks. If, if people are going into it and they're not earning and they are purchasing the product just for themselves, you want them to be able to do that. But what you do not want to see happen with any companies, and we all know that in every industry there are good actors and mm-hmm. there are bad actors. And so what you want to do is make certain that they individuals do not go into this buying things and then have no opportunity to sell that back if they go, hey, uh, we're finding that this is impossible to make any money. And another thing, as a component of that, as you want them to have buyback programs, 
the other thing is you don't want individuals that end up in, I don't think the companies, reputable companies, want individuals to end up with product and then try to sell that product online uh, in order to offload it. And it could be that the product is expired or the product is being priced differently or overpriced. Mm -hmm. And so you have to think in terms of that distribution system also, because years ago, that is an outlet that really was not available. But I, I imagine that you and I both know people, and most of your listeners probably know people who have gone in as a way to supplement their income to help get children through college or maybe to save for a down payment for a house. If they decided to work with one of the direct sales companies like a Mary Kay or an Arbonne or Avon and build a base of customers and build a small base of customers or maybe their business, a business that they had and they decided they wanted to offer a cosmetic line or cosmetic product. And we have hundreds of women who do things like that. So let's make certain that people understand the rules of the road, that there are some definitions, that they know they can exercise that opportunity and earn money to help support their family, but also know that they're not going to be burdened, that there are ways to offload that product and that the consumers are protected in the process. And those who would seek an opportunity are also protected in the process. Now, uh, Congressman Moulinar's uh, amendment, which is obviously not yours, is, is actually going to um, uh, cut funding and limit the enforcement opportunities for the FTC. Both of your bills are saying that this should not affect their enforcement of, of uh, anti-pyramid uh, actions. Um, does that sort of uh, limiting of the FTC speak a little bit of, uh, against being able to keep doing that? I, I think that what we want to do is, uh, what I would like to do is to see FTC be aggressive in their um, reviews, in their policing, in their oversight of all of these consumer-related uh, entities. That is their job, and that is what we want them to be able to do, and they should be. Because the more aggressive their oversight is and their policing and their review is, then the healthier the marketplace is going to be because you're going to root out the bad actors. Okay, we're under a minute. You're, I don't think either of your bills have a provision for false earnings claims or false science claims, et cetera, which has also been an issue. Where are you on that? What we want to do is, uh, as we talk with other people, we've worked for the past couple of years or so with direct sellers and looking at things that ought to be into a bill. And what we want to do is to continue to work with it. If there are components that individuals feel like need to be addressed or need to be uh, more pronounced in the bill, then that is something uh, that needs to be put on the table and be a part of the discussion. All right, we've had a great conversation with Congressman Marsha Blackman uh, proposing the Anti-Pyramid Promotional Scheme Act of 2017. She also does a lot of good work promoting small business and economic growth, and we appreciate your time, Congressman. Thank you so much. Thank Bye-bye. You. This is Forensic Talk with Jim Campbell. All talk and all crime, the nation's biggest murders, financial crimes on Wall Street, the facts, the forensics, the inside stories today. And we're joined now by Joseph Mariano, president of the U.S. Direct Selling Association, the National Trade Association for companies that offer entrepreneurial opportunities to independent sellers to market and sell products and services typically outside of a fixed retail establishment. Welcome, Joe. Thanks for joining us. Thank you, Jim. It's good to be here. Uh, For folks that uh, really don't know the business, tell us briefly the, the scope of the direct selling business and its impact on the economy. Well, actually, it's a worldwide business, but in the United States alone, we have a record number of salespeople and, and a huge amount of sales, over $30 billion in sales in 2016, and over 20 million people, almost 22 million people who sell directly uh, through this person-to-person, face-to-face sales method. 
Okay, there are two laws, an amendment from uh, Congressman Mulinar of Michigan and Congressman uh, Blackburn of Tennessee, who we just spoke with, that are supposed to be anti-pyramid scheme mm-hmm. laws. Can you tell us exactly how they get rid of uh, pyramid schemes in, in, your, in your opinion? Sure. Well, actually, the language of both of these uh, proposals is very similar. And, and as I understand it, it parallels something that the Direct Selling Association has supported for many years and worked on for many years at the state level as well as at the federal level. And, and that is it defines pyramid schemes as those that compensate people primarily for recruitment rather than product sales. And that's a pretty fundamental definition that's been used uh, at the state and federal level uh, for decades and decades effectively to prosecute these schemes. The second thing that the language does in each of these proposals is address a concern that legitimate direct selling companies have, and we don't want to be confused with pyramid schemes, um, whereby the question of whether or not salespeople can actually use the product themselves and whether that's a legitimate practice, well, that's clarified so that there's no question about that whatsoever. That practice would be able to continue as long as people are really using the product. All right, which raises a question. I have uh, Dr. Peter Vandernat, former FTC economist, mm-hmm. pyramid expert, who's calling this a pyramid protection yeah. law, says that this ignores 30 years of case law by essentially you could, you could in, the, in the way this law envisions, only do internal sales, which historically has been considered a pyramid scheme because uh, recruiting is what's got all these folks in there. What, 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 how do you respond to that? Well, actually, it's just plain wrong. First, it's not a protection scheme at all. It, it will pro- promote a good, strong consumer protection law by defining pyramid schemes along the lines that I've suggested. But this whole question of personal use or internal consumption, mm-hmm. Mr. Vandernet just has wrong. In, in fact, if you look at the case law going back 30, 40 years, you will find that these very principles are enshrined in all of those decisions and those statutes. For example, look at uh, virtually every state law has some anti-pyramid uh, component in it, and at least 20 of those laws have specific language that protects personal use of the product by individuals. More importantly, uh, the FTC just a few years ago, in fact, uh, prosecuted a pyramid scheme, and the court in the Ninth Circuit Court of Appeals, a case called Burn Lounge, specifically rejected this focus on personal use of the product and said, you know what, people can use the product. That shouldn't be the be-all and end-all. Look, we've got legitimate companies where salespeople actually use the product themselves. If you're an Avon lady or Mary Kay beauty consultant or any number of of legitimate direct selling companies, of course you're going to want to use the product as a salesperson. And in fact, our statistics suggest clearly that a large percentage of people get involved in these businesses because they want to get the product at a discount. They might sell as well but they also want to use the product themselves. So for, for anyone to suggest that that's a uh, sign of illegitimacy is just wrong. It's sort of a red herring, and it actually benefits pyramid schemes to focus on that because it, it distracts from the real aspects of pyramids. All right, let me ask you this. Both bills claim they will have no effect on limiting enforcement by the FTC, mm-hmm. but Congressman Moulinar's bill actually cuts funding uh, for it, and now with the sales uh, definition so expanded, it, it might be tougher to enforce. Um, wh- wh- what are your thoughts on that? No, no, I think that's actually a, a misreading of the legislation as I understand it. There's no funding cut for enforcement against pyramid schemes. The provision merely says, look, what you can't do is find something to be a pyramid scheme based upon the fact that somebody has personal consumption. Instead, it says, Focus on whether recruitment is is the basis for compensation rather than product sales to real people. So, and, and in fact, the commission, as I understand it, under either provision, uh, would still have full authority under its general FTC Act to prohibit any unfair deceptive practice. And if somebody's being defrauded, if somebody's uh, being misrepresented about earnings claims, if somebody is compensating uh, individuals for recruitment rather than product sales. The Federal Trade Commission, together with their state brethren, have absolutely full power to to prosecute these operations. Let me tell you something, if I can, Jim. Mm -hmm. I mean, because I've had a lot of experience working with state AGs and and others on this type of legislation and public policy. Remember, it's in our interest to make sure that people understand the differences between pyramid schemes and legitimate direct selling companies and that pyramid schemes be put out of business unequivocally. When when we have supported similar legislation in the states over decades, we have said 
if you ever have a problem, if you can't enforce this uh, strongly against pyramid schemes, come back to us. We'll happily, as the legitimate industry, work with you. Um, we think of ourselves as consumer protection uh, uh, protectors in the business sector. We'll, we'll uh, certainly work to have any changes and make it stronger. In 25, 30 years of doing this, not one state, not one attorney general, not one consumer protection official who actually uses the law has come back to us to say we want to change and, in fact, have used these laws to prosecute pyramid schemes highly effectively. Companies and operations like Burn Lounge, like Fortune High Tech Marketing, and a range of others across the country over many years. I raised this with Congressman uh, uh, Blackburn as well, that um, there's not provisions yet for false earnings claims and false science, which have been a big issue. Uh, All 26 of the FTC pyramid schemes uh, prosecuted all made false claims. Bonnie uh, Patton, who you will speak with mm-hmm. in, in, uh, in, our, in our final segment, we have a little mini-debate, sure. um, says that a lot of your members, I think uh, she's far as 60 out of 62 nutritional-oriented, uh, make, make illegal science claims, mm-hmm. health claims. Well, the bill itself, of course, isn't limited to uh, um, any one specific area. The law is clear. You can't make wrong-headed claims. You can't make and engage in unfair deceptive practices. As you point out, that can be prosecuted by the Federal Trade Commission and other authorities, and any such claims should be prosecuted, any such unfair deceptive practices. Nothing in the bill limits the power of the Federal Trade Commission to do that or any law enforcement. And, of course, we support prosecution and uh, discipline for those kinds of errant claims. With regard to you know specifics and in, in any instance, we can talk about that, I guess, in the next segment. Um, but sure, uh, things sometimes are said that are inaccurate in any business model by any sellers, and the Federal Trade Commission should be fully empowered to go after them. Joe, how do, you, how do you enforce in the DSA, then, if they're violating your code of ethics on that? Yeah, we have an independent code administrator, and our code of ethics is constantly being uh, updated. In fact, uh, just last year, uh, we went through, and our code administrator worked with companies to identify problems and things that they were saying, but um, and correct those so that companies do, in fact, uh, acknowledge uh, when there's a problem and can correct any kind of claim, but more importantly, to work with the code administrator and us in, in their own processes to make sure that if any of their independent contractor sellers who sometimes might cross the line or say something that's inaccurate, that those people are disciplined and dealt with. If a company doesn't comply with our code and refuses to make changes uh, as, as requested or demanded by the code administrator, they're subject to a range of disciplinary procedures, including and up to expulsion. It's important to remember, however, that uh, less than 50% of the companies that actually apply to become members of the Direct Selling Association actually get in because they go through a year-long, minimum of a year-long review process, during which time we take a look at their marketing plans, the claims, things that are being said on social media and the like. And based upon those standards and that review, as I say, less than 50% actually get in. All right, we've been joined by Joe Mariano. He will be back for our final segment where he and Bonnie Patton of Truth and Advertising will go head-to-head and we'll get both sides of it. And we're back for our final national segment. We've got Joe Mariano, the president of the Industry Trade Group, the Direct Selling Association, and Bonnie Patton, executive director of truthandadvertising.org. It's our little mini-debate to end things. Um, Bonnie, uh, start off, and then Joe can respond. Why why are you calling this a Pyramid Protection Act, briefly? Uh, Basically, I think that if this bill isn't enacted, it will result in the proliferation of pyramid schemes. It's going to victimize consumers. And it's going to upend the last 40 years of established case law. Joe, is that true? No, I have, couldn't disagree more. In fact, the language parallels uh, principles and, in fact, specifics of statutes and laws and prosecutions for the last 40 years that I've been involved in in public policy discussions and debates. So there's a lot of experience, a lot of uh, case law out there, and, and state statutes. 21 state laws parallel the precise provisions of this by talking about personal use of product, by defining pyramid schemes as those that compensate people primarily for recruitment. I think that uh, actually you'll see much more effective uh, anti-pyramid enforcement and the growth of of legitimate direct selling because of the clarity in the marketplace that this would provide. Bonnie can answer first and then Joe. In our last segment, uh, Christine Richard was telling us that the FTC and the ruling on Herbalife said that you have to be able to demonstrate retail sales 
Do you believe that this law, Bonnie, changes that? And, Joe, then your comment on enforcement. Oh, it absolutely changes it, and it really eliminates the need for retail sales, and it permits inventory loading. This kind of law ties the hands of government officials, and what we're going to see is no more litigation in the pyramid scheme realm. Joe. Well, it's, again, it's just not accurate. It'll go back. You can see numerous pyramid prosecutions that have been undertaken against pyramid schemes pursuant to the stat lo- state law. Uh, look at Fortune High Tech Marketing just a couple of years ago, as well as other ones. Um, but with regard to the specifics in terms of inventory loading and, and retail customers, absolutely, there should be real customers for uh, a real product in any legitimate business, including direct selling businesses. And all this statute would do was acknowledge that sometimes – individual salespeople can also be real customers. There's been a rule or a myth developing that somehow uh, individual direct salespeople can't also be legitimate customers of the product, and that's just ludicrous. That's all the bill is trying to do in our understanding, is to uh, to make everyone uh, appreciate the fact that if you're a direct seller, you might not only sell the product, but you also could use it, and in fact, that may be a primary motivation for getting involved, and there's nothing wrong with that. All right. Now, this bill um, uh, introduces uh, inventory loading. It deals with that, saying that the uh, distributor should be able to get 90 percent of the cost back if he's stuck with inventory. Mm -hmm. Do you uh, is that is that Bonnie, is that will it be effective? Absolutely not. I mean, we've seen in past prosecutions such as Vima or Herbalife that you can have these rules in place. And um, that doesn't mean that in practicality uh, they will be effective. Even members within the DSA are saying that this bill is just a cover for pyramid schemes that are engaged in inventory loading, and they know how to get around these um, 90% uh, buyback rules. And, Joe, before you answer that, um, Mm -hmm. uh, I think in the first segment, maybe it was Bill Keefe, said that that it's actually uh, it's actually socially awkward to do it too because if you do that, your upline, your folks that have brought you in, who you may even know, uh, have to give back commission too. So, are there disincentives to make this work? The fact of the matter is, the statute would require at least the, the Representative Blackburn's bill would require uh, individuals and companies to repurchase inventory. And if you didn't do it. As a company, if you got around it, as Bonnie suggests or others, that would actually now be prosecutable. The FTC would be able to bring action against you for not having an effective buyback. So it's just the opposite. This empowers law enforcement to say, you've promised a buyback and you don't have one, we're going to take you to jail. So it's actually a much stronger provision. I stand fully square behind the buyback provision, and I've heard the argument that somehow people are not willing to do it. Well, again, That just hasn't been the case. Uh, People do take advantage of the buyback all the time, uh, as as well they should. So uh, I just think the facts don't bear that that argument out. Are you more comfortable now, Bonnie? (laughs) No, I I think uh, in reality, buyback doesn't work. All right, let's get to... um uh, the the uh, and Joe talked about this too. The DSA has a code of ethics. It's independently uh, monitored. And uh, Bonnie, from your Tina group, uh, you've made claims that there's a lot of illegitimate health uh, claims made by uh, multi-level marketing firms, including ones that are in the DSA. That's correct. We've collected thousands of examples of companies and/or their distributors making illegal health claims. I should note. That to date, about a thousand of those were taken down after uh, Tina.org outed those claims. So, uh, Joe, is she claiming that your your code of ethics is is not enforced all that tough? Well, we've had a challenge uh, over the years. We have products that are being sold by our companies that include cosmetics, nutritional items, vacuum cleaners, long-distance telephone service, you, you name it, direct sellers sell it. And while it's absolutely true that unfair marketing practices and sales practices like uh, errant claims about products – Uh, are under the code administrator and should be taken seriously by us. It's difficult to have expertise in any of these areas. That's why I actually welcome uh, Tina's and Bonnie's observations and ability to look at some of the nutritional claims. We've taken them quite seriously. I know our companies have taken her concerns seriously as well. And uh, as she said, you know, when identified, many of those companies have dealt with them. It turns out that a lot of those things date back to years and years by and social media by individual sellers and what we've done in response 
both because of our own attention to this as well as the observations that Bonnie has made, we actually have put in now even stricter standards with regard to product claims and are devoting more resources so that even though we have this wide range of products, particularly on nutritionals, we'll be able to look at that even more closely. Okay, there's about 30 seconds for each of you. We've got to be quick. Uh, recruiting orientation, Bonnie, has always been considered a sign of uh, pyramid schemes. Do you think that uh, that's going to be lessened with this new law? Absolutely not. And that's not just my opinion. That's the opinion of one of the current FTC chairmen, past and present commissioners of the FTC, and even some DSA members, including Melaleuca and Herbalife. All right, Joe, and uh, the, the, the industry failure rate, of course, is very high, and there's some bad apples which you want to get rid of, too. Let me give you the last word on, uh, on uh, why it's a great business. Well, I think you'll see a lot of people coming out in support not only of the bill but of the business model. In fact, you have academics, researchers, former FTC folks, former AGs, and a lot. Look, we empower individuals to engage in this business and earn a little bit of extra income, benefit themselves by purchasing the product at a discount and helping their communities. In a time of economic struggle and challenge and developing economy, economic models like, like Uber and Lyft, this is sort of a tried and true way for individuals to earn a little bit of extra money, and, and it's a great thing. It's been around forever. I think it'll be around for a long, long time helping people. Well, I really appreciate the two folks uh, at the lead of this industry and who are on opposite positions are willing to come together. Joe Mariano, president of the Direct Selling Association. Bonnie Patton, executive director of truthandadvertising.org. Crusaders on both sides of the issues. Thanks to Joe Mariano, Bonnie Patton, Congressman Marsha Blackburn, Dean Bill Keith, Christine Richard. This is Forensic Talk with Jim Campbell. All talk and all crime, the nation's biggest murders, financial crimes on Wall Street. The facts, the forensics, the inside stories today. Forensic Talk with Jim Campbell announcing a new crime show on Mondays at 6 p.m. on 1490 WGCH. All talk and all crime, the nation's biggest murders were the go-to source for the Moxley murder of the Skakel Appeals. Financial crimes on Wall Street, inside the crimes of Russia's Putin and more. The facts, the forensics, the inside stories. From the host of Business Talk with Jim Campbell, it's Forensic Talk with Jim Campbell. All talk and all crime, Mondays at 6 p.m. right after the Lisa Wexer Show on 1490 WGCH and WGCH.com anywhere.